All right, so in this first lecture, we're going to see what actually is a process in an operating system. So first, if we take a look on the conceptual architecture of a computer, we know that at the bottom we got the hardware, which contains the CPU, the memory and devices like peripherals and other external components. On top of that, we got the first software layer in a computer, which is the operating system. And based on that, we got the applications layer, which contains all the applications managed by the user. The operating system is a very complex component with lots of responsibilities like security performance and many others, but probably one of the most important ones is task management. And by task, I'm referring to any program that should be executed on the CPU, which is launched by the user or by the operating system itself. So let's see in more detail how this works. Let's say we have a program, which is just a text file with instructions stored on the local disk. To be able to run it on the CPU, we need to compile it to get an executable binary file, which can be a jar or an exe or any other executable format that is also stored on the local disk. Now, when we launch the binary file into the execution, the operating system will create a process object that is stored into the memory in that case. From now on, the process will be completely managed by the operating system. So if we have to define a process, we can say that a process is an instance of a program loaded into memory. Or more generically, a process is a unit of work in an operating system. Keep in mind that a process is not an active entity. It's just an object stored in memory that contains information about the execution of a particular program. A process always has a state. When you create a process, its initial state will be new. When the process is able to be run on the CPU, it will immediately transition to the ready state. The operating system has a dedicated component called scheduler, which is responsible for selecting processes from the ready state and placing them onto the CPU in order to be executed. The process runs on the CPU for a while and it can be moved to the ready state by the operating system when it decides to let other processes to use the CPU. This behavior is called preemption and we'll take a closer look on how it works further in this lecture. A running process can also be moved into the waiting state if it needs to wait for some external resources like for some data that needs to be received over the network, for example. And finally, when a process does not have any other instructions to be executed, it will move to the terminated state. Now let's assume that we have one CPU core and we got three processes launched by the user and we want to see how those processes move through those states. Usually, if the system has enough capacity, the processes will move directly to the ready state. The scheduler picks one process based on a well-defined algorithm and moves it into the running state. It picks only one process because there is only one CPU core available. The chosen process runs for a while on the CPU and then it needs access to some external resource, which may take some time so it gets moved into the waiting state. As soon as the CPU is free, the scheduler immediately takes another process and moves it into the running state. The waiting process receives the data from the external component and moves into the ready state, waiting to be picked by the scheduler again. The currently running process is preempted by the operating system because its time slice has elapsed, and the workflow continues until all the instructions of the processes are executed and they move to the terminated state. This workflow is actually called the process lifecycle. Now, if you have three CPU cores, for example, we will be able to handle three processes in parallel, which triples the throughput of the entire system. Now, let's take a look on what preemption really is. Let's imagine we have a single CPU core and we have a process that is called clock, which is responsible for simply printing the current time on the screen. If that process is the only one that is running on the CPU, the system will become unresponsive because there are other processes that need to use the CPU, like your browser or the UI components of the operating system. So to solve that issue, each process is assigned a particular time limit during which it's able to use the CPU. In that way, the CPU will execute small parts of a process at different times, rather than executing the same process for a large amount of time, leaving space for other processes to be executed. This mechanism is called preemptive multitasking, and this should always be perceived with a trade-off in mind. Because operating systems that are user-oriented like Windows, Mac OS, Ubuntu, and others 
need to be responsive. So processes related to UI components are likely to be scheduled more on the CPU by leveraging the preemptive multitasking. On the other hand, server-side systems like Windows Server or Ubuntu Server usually need performance rather than responsiveness, so their scheduler will likely favor long-running processes. So basically, you should have in mind the type of the workload you're currently running to see if too much multitasking can become a problem. Now, regarding the time limit for which processes should execute on the CPU, it actually has a name, it's called Time Slice, and its value is usually 100 milliseconds on Linux, but it's dynamically adjusted by the operating system anyway, so you can't really tell which value it has at any given time. When the process being run on the CPU is changed with another one, this operation is called context switch, and we'll see in the next lectures why this operation could become a problem in terms of performance. Now, the last important aspect that we need to know about a process is the actual information that it stores. We just saw previously that a process lives in the memory, but what it actually contains. Well, first it needs to contain the current state that it has, running, waiting, terminated, or any other state, a unique ID, which is just a number to identify the process, some privileges that specify on which resources the process has access to, a pointer to the next extraction that needs to be executed, the data that was stored in the CPU registers when the process was switched off the CPU, some information related to the scheduling process, like priority for example, information related to the virtual memory currently allocated by the process, a pointer to the parent process, and some information related to which file descriptors are being used. This data structure is called process control block and its content can slightly vary depending on the operating system. So that's pretty much all you need to know about a process in the context of multithreading.